This Week in Radio Tech, episode 218, is brought to you by Lavo, maker of the new crystal clear virtual radio console. It's the radio console with a multi touch touchscreen interface. And by the Telos Zip 1 IP audio codec. Telos is the best way to hear from there. Hey, Bob Newberry at Clear Channel in Birmingham, Alabama, oversees engineering at 11 radio stations plus four HD signals. Pushing the technology envelope means using new IP radio technologies along with IP telephone systems. And both areas give Bob more options, better quality audio, and some money savings too. Joe Talbot from Telos joins me talking with Bob about learning SIP technology while putting it to good use. Hey, welcome in and thanks for joining us. This is This Week in Radio Tech. It's the weekly show where we get together with some engineers in the radio biz and talk about what's going on, talk about the jobs that we do, talk about how we take care of equipment, how to fix equipment, share some ideas on, on just making the broadcast plant work better. You know, radio broadcasting is just such a, a still a huge industry across the country. 13,000 radio stations in the U.S., something like uh, 45 or 50,000 stations around the world. And so, uh, hey, we've got a big audience of, of engineers and folks who want to be engineers, maybe program directors and talent who like to understand what the engineer is doing and how to put uh, uh, new, uh, new concepts to use. So that's what the show's about. Our show is brought to you by two terrific sponsors, uh, the folks at Lavo, L-A-W-O, Lavo. Uh, they make the crystal clear uh, uh, virtual radio console. We'll be talking about that in a little bit. And also brought to you by the Telos Alliance. And this week our sponsor is the Telos Zip One. IP audio codec. I may even try to do a little demo of the Zip One here before we before we get done with the show. All right, that's uh, that's the ifs, ands, or where wherefores. Let's let's bring in our uh, co-host. He's here every <laughs> once in a while, and uh, great guy. He's the telephony guru. It's Joe Talbot from the High Desert in uh, somewhere near Area Fifty One. Hey, Joe, how are you? Very close. Hi there. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's good to see you. I see you got your office cleaned up. I had I had to do that right before you told me about the show, so I moved all the papers out of view here. You can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> Just being well, honest. Actually, hey, hey, uh, I, I'm not telling, giving away, uh, talking out of school. If I say that Joe Joe bought a really interesting house uh, near Area fixer. 51, it was a fixer upper, buddy. You got a great deal, buddy. You really did. Crazy house. I I think you could hold the next uh, Telos corporate meeting out there. We've been talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> And I understand you just you got you got the pool. The pool's good and warm now for swimming. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. You're, yeah. In fact, I've been you're... working on a little pump house for it. So that's my non-technical project here the last few weeks. So very nice, very nice. Well, Joe, we're glad to have you along. And Joe, I, I thought of I asking you on the show at the last minute. So hey, thanks for shoving stuff aside and being with us sure. for an hour here, or however long you can stay. Uh, let's bring in our guest. Our guest. Uh, I've been waiting to talk to this guy on our show for a long time. Uh, it's my friend. I met ten years ago when I was uh, showing off some Omnia audio processing. It's Bob Newberry. Bob, uh, welcome in. You are the uh, director of engineering for the Clear Channel cluster in Birmingham, plus a couple of other. Uh, uh, bedroom That's right. Yeah, yeah. Tuscaloosa and Gadsden, Birmingham. Right, sixty miles one way, sixty miles the other, and <laughs> we're in the middle. Well, Bob, I think maybe you and I have both aged a bit since the last time we talked. Oh yeah, I know I have. By the way, it's my birthday today. Really? Well, happy yeah. birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I, I think we'll probably hold off singing because we do want to keep the audience through the whole show. Yeah. So definitely don't want to use candles at this age. <laughs> Man, I hope you have hope you have a great birthday. So uh, that thanks for thanks for letting us know about that, and thanks for joining us on this special day. I thought you'd be taking the day off. Oh no, never. Mm. So uh, so so let's we're going to get into some ideas about SIP telephony, and that's been a hot topic among broadcast engineers. You know, the whole business community uh, has been moving into SIP telephony for years now, and broadcast engineers are a little slower to take it up, partly because the equipment to do it, to put callers on the air via SIP telephony, that has just been coming online. And well, I guess the, the Telos VX system has been around for about three years. So only the last three years has SIP telephony been convenient to put on the air. So we're going to go there. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So I want you just to stay tuned for that. But Bob, I thought we'd open the show and and, and just chat for a few minutes about uh, broadcast engineering, radio engineering, like you do for a, a big cluster in a city like Birmingham, Alabama. What, what, uh, you know, what's going on in Birmingham, and what's on your, uh, 
on your weekly horizon here with uh, in terms of engineering issues and things to solve? Well, most everything we do has, uh, you know, most of our problems revolve around air conditioning and generators, emergency generators, more than more than the transmitters. The transmitter plants are fairly stable. It's all the support equipment that usually goes south a lot. But oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. I've got uh, eight FM stations uh, in three markets, uh, three AMs, three translators, and four HD stations we're running. Wow. Uh, okay. Out, mostly out of Birmingham. We have studios in Tuscaloosa and Gadsden, like I said. And that's, that's also have been my test bed, so to speak, for our uh, SIP phone systems. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, okay. I can have a breakdown a little easier over there than I can here in Birmingham. We'll, but, we'll talk about we that. Use, yeah, go ahead. Uh, did you want to get into that later? Oh, uh, no, I don't want to put it off a long time. I just kind of wanted to get a feel for what your life is like engineering in a, in a, in a big southern city, Birmingham, uh, you know, an old city. It used to be, uh, actually, folks may not know this, a big iron-producing city because of the, the iron mines that you've got around Birmingham. Uh, oh, yeah. Tell us what, <clears throat> what the market is like. What market size are you in there? It's all about health now. Uh, they, they've shed that blue-collar image and, and gone with uh, uh, medicine. And if you're going to get sick, Birmingham would be the place to do it now. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't know. What is our market size? I, I, I'm, I should know that, but I, I want to say it's around 70 or high 60s. I don't know. Just outside ah. of the top 50. Gotcha. I thought that would um, be bigger than that one. But, uh, uh, well, you, I lost my train I'm, of I'm looking at Birmingham radio market sizes. I'm, I'm really curious. It seems like a big city whenever I visit you guys. I don't whenever think I... it's – what's Nashville? Uh, no. Nashville for radio is about 44 or so. Yeah, I think we're right outside the top 50. See, I should have my program director in here, but I, I really let him do all that. Uh, you're right. We're, Birmingham's number I've 57. I've got uh, one assistant – a very capable man, Richard Spavins, and I've got a a, a great IT guy, and uh, he keeps me out of trouble most of the time, or backs me out of the trouble I usually get into. Um, yeah, and that's uh, Ed Hyde. So both of those guys together and I just kind of uh, 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 run these three markets, and it, it's it's quite a challenge sometimes because the weather moves from west to east. Uh, Tuscaloosa is to the west, Gadsden to the east. So if we have uh, troubles, that's the way it usually rolls. And somebody has to roll one direction, and I'll roll the other direction. But you got, you know, you a guys, good night we can get through it. You guys occasionally yeah. get some really wicked weather there. I, my uh, my friend, and, uh, yeah, a guest on this show, uh, uh, James Spann, uh, has uh, yeah. um, you know done a lot of tornado coverage, play by play. He was a guest mm -hmm. on the show here a few years ago. Uh, you guys get some wicked weather, but Tuscaloosa tends to get it first, huh, before it moves into Birmingham? They get it and first, right. Yeah, we lost a tower about three years ago during that tornado uh, through there. And uh, and then Birmingham, we didn't do too bad. But, but yeah, we have our, our challenges with the weather. Do you have any towers on uh, mountains around there? Because it is a bit mountainous around Birmingham. In Birmingham, yeah. Most of the TV and radio is right on Red Mountain. And that's where our studios are, too, about a mile from one tower and about four miles from another one of our towers. Uh, our main tower is what we call Ishkuda, where we've got Ishkuda, three of our restaurants right. on it. Um, uh, I should know my geography better, but I don't. Uh, I, 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 when I follow weather in uh, Alabama, um, they always talk about Chihaw Mountain. Where's that? Oh, yeah, that's uh, between Anniston and Gadsden to the east of uh, ah. Alabama. Yeah, it's the highest point in Alabama. Okay. okay. I couldn't tell you exactly what the height is. In fact, I'm I, sure when I first first met you Go some ahead. years ago, it seems like you had just installed a bunch of uh, Logitech consoles in your control rooms, and you were looking, yeah. uh, and you had just installed a, a backup STL system uh, to your HD stations, and you ended up using um, some high-quality, expensive IP radios. Yeah, those were the Dragon Wave uh, air pairs, and they're still running. They're uh, nine and a half years and counting. Uh, wow. uh, we have two of those. Well, the newer one is a Dragon Wave Horizon, and one goes to the Arishkuta Tower, and the other one goes to the Golden Crest Tower. 
but they're 100 megabit full duplex radios, so they're carrier class radios. Uh, ubiquity, ubiquity wasn't out then, but there's a, there's a new Ubiquity radio I'd love to try out if I f could find an excuse to use it. Air fiber? It's air fiber, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's, I had those radios, uh, the uh, Dragon Waves at my station in San Francisco, and they were, they were pretty good, but boy, those were expensive at the time. They were very expensive. I think we paid 25000 per system on, for Ooh. both ends of it. Same here. But uh, they're, they're very reliable. The, oh, the, they're 18 gig. Uh, radios, uh, the the short path is a mile, and that, that just keeps running uh, through any kind of weather. But I do occasionally, if we have a torrential downpour, I'll have a little problem with that. Uh, it's a five-mile path going the other direction with two-foot dishes. Mm -hmm. So I could either increase the dish size or uh, mm -hmm. right now what I do is fall back to our 950 equipment. And uh, and the HD just kind of goes silent for till the rain cloud passes. <laughs> To, to bring up to speed any uh, non-engineers listening or watching, we're talking about uh, studio transmitter links. So getting audio from the studios where the content creation happens and getting it out to transmitter sites. And, you know, traditionally in broadcast, broadcasters have used, uh, well, wired facilities like uh, T1 circuits from the phone company. Uh, but very often they use uh, 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 radios, analog radios, and then along came some digital uh, modulation techniques uh, in the 950 megahertz band. Uh, that band is not quite microwave, not quite considered microwave, and it, it does okay in the rain. Now, you know, the higher you go up in frequency, the more uh, rain, or as we call hydrometeors, the more hydrometeors attenuate the signal that's trying to travel. So you go up these really high frequencies like uh, 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 5, 7, 18, 20-some gigahertz, and they're quickly affected by, by rain and attenuating the signal. So, Bob, that's what you're referring to. You still have a backup at 950 megahertz in case you just get a torrential downpour and the, the microwave uh, signal becomes unusable. That's right. We also have uh, IP at 928 in the ISM band, uh, what people usually call land link. It's diplexed in with the uh, STL dishes, mm -hmm. so yeah. it makes a very easy installation. There's no separate antennas to install. What kind of bit rate do you get uh, out of a, a 900 megahertz ISM band radio? Well, it depends on how much of the bandwidth you're using. They don't give you a lot of channels. Um, the way we're set up, I think we're doing, I want to say, 10, uh, 10 megahertz bandwidth, but you, we get like f a choice of four channels. Fortunately, mm -hmm. there's no, nobody else down there because of the, it, it's, you, you don't get it quite the, the throughput at that band than you would in uh, two or five gig bands. Right. Uh, but, right. but with these ubiquity radios we're using, we, we can do three to four uh, megabits per second. Oh goodness! Okay, uh, so you, you could you could do coded audio comfortably. Yeah, yeah. We have our uh, our SIP telephones out at the transmitter sites, even on a double hop of these uh, of these ubiquity radios. This is a little radio we 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 generally use. It's a uh, unit. Uh, what do they call this? A um, nano bridge. A nano, nano station. Nano yeah, station. the nano okay. station M nine hundred. Oh, but so that's a nine hundred megahertz. Uh, yeah, around, around 928 is, is where yeah. that band is. And before the but, show, you were t you were telling us that you don't – now, that's an antenna and a radio together. You disconnect the antenna. Yeah, and you, this is a flat antenna. And yeah. you uh, in the software, you can disconnect the uh, built-in antenna and go to uh, external antenna. There's a connector in there. It's a tiny little uh, e reversed SMA connector. And it's like that's the connector. And oh, this yeah. is the adapter that goes to regular N. And then that N uh, will go on your uh, diplexer that you use to diplex into the same transmission line and antenna that you're using for your STL. And this is and, it's as easy as it gets. Uh, Joe, maybe you had experience with this. I never was lucky enough to do this, but some years ago, must have been maybe 15, even longer years ago, the guys at Mosley came up with this idea. Uh, uh, you've got a 950 megahertz uh, STL. Hopefully it's a Mosley brand as, as far as they were concerned. And there's this band right next to or close to the broadcaster's 950. 928, yeah. Yeah, it's called the ISM. Uh, uh, what's it? What's a industrial Instrumentation scientific medical or, Oh, good. Yeah. And so it's it's license free. So you get 
some radios that are on that band. And guess what? Your 950 megahertz antenna will work okay for this stuff. It's not too bad off frequency. And so if you Close diplex, you, you take these two radios, your STL radio at 950 and your ISM radio, and you can diplex them together and go up the same coax you have up into the antenna. And, and then the same thing at the transmitter site, receive it and split it to both. And now you've got a data link as, as well as your normal audio link. So, Joe, did you ever get to play with that stuff? I never did the land link stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I did start getting into the ubiquity stuff. I like the, the bullets, uh, this kind of radio here, because it's got a uh, end connector already right on it, and then the oh. POE on the other side. Um, and I use these all over the place. I've been using it as an STL at a friend's station now for about three years, and it's been terrific. Um, plus, they have these in the 900 megahertz band, the 2.4, and the 5 gigahertz band as well. And um, and the thing I love about these is, and I just bought them as an experiment. These are cheap. This is like between fifty nine and seventy nine bucks an ant. Oh, um, you can do a lot of damage with that. And I mean, I I got. I remember I got the boxes and I took them out in the field. I was out in the desert that day, and uh, did a ten mile shot with a friend of mine. Just boom, we just pull off the side of the road and had one at his house pointed down in a particular direction, and we just. It lit up and it just worked, and uh, that's been my experience with all this stuff. Never had a failure, but it's dirt cheap. I guess at that point, the the diplex, if you're gonna diplex it into your existing antennas, the diplexer ends up costing more than the radio does. Oh, absolutely. The the diplexer is critical because you don't want to be sending any of your STL back into the radio. So I mean, it's got to be tuned correctly and everything like that. But that's pretty uh, easy to do with those frequencies. I know uh, before the show, Bob, uh, you mentioned that Microwave Filter Company sells these, and I just happened to look online. I did a quick Google search for Microwave Filter Company and uh, ISM 950 megahertz, and sure enough, it's right here. Um, it's their model 18486. It lets you combine or pass um, 944 to 952 megahertz. That's, you know, that's the uh, radio STL. And then the other pass band is 902 to 928 megahertz. That's the ISM band. And so this lets you uh, combine uh, into one antenna or split from one antenna back to two radios. That's pretty interesting. I wonder what that box costs. Anybody know? I want to say it's uh, $700 maybe, six to 700 Okay, for each uh, diplexer. Yeah, I mean, it's metal. It's not plastic like in it. Yeah. <laughs> like the ubiquitous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like and I, I, I imagine there's a lot of tuning, you know, a lot of... Uh, of uh, hand tuning that goes in on the thing that probably drives the cost up, oh, but yeah. that's really the way to go. That that gives you an IP connection, and you could you could put a little uh, a pair of codecs on there, uh, and uh, uh, use those for a backup STL. When you have problems with your main STL, you could just switch over to that. We do that. We do that here as, actually as a tertiary uh, a way of getting uh, out to our sites. We usually have a uh, besides two. Uh, uh, microwave systems, we have that running on the antenna too, and that gives us if, if we have trouble with the with the uh, Starlink or something like that, we can switch over to that. Or uh, we also usually have a, an ISP if we can out at each transmitter site, and we'll oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. and we'll hang a little codec on that too. To, We've uh, got customers using Axia nodes on that, so it's uncompressed. It sounds like a million bucks. Got a oh, friend yeah. down in Palm Springs who just who lit up some radios, and uh, he's got four channels. Yeah, we do on that right on our on our our Dragon Waves. We have Axia nodes that uh, uh, we, we have a node here, and we put all eight uh, all eight channels on it, and it's going to run uh, five one way and three the other uh, on on uh, Dragon Wave radios. Yeah, it's like yeah. a it's kind of like a super snake, uh, uncompressed. <laughs> yeah, it is. Works real it well. Sound, it sounds good too. I understand. Oh, excellent. Oh, amazing. And, yeah. and you, hey, I'm I'm really glad to know about that uh the the bullet uh that you showed uh Joe and the uh 900 the M900 uh, that you showed uh Bob the, these uh, the more you look into these ubiquity radios this the more amazing this is. I'll show you a little show and tell here. I've uh this is just 2.4 gigahertz so it's Wi-Fi band unlicensed and here's uh, here's the reflector. This is the small one that that uh, ubiquity uh sells. Uh, and then this is the mount right here. The reflector, you know, goes on there. Now, here's the business end right here. This is the, the radio is here. It, there's an Ethernet right there. You power it with PoE. And then this ends up all fitting together like this. So you have, a you know, a focal point and all that, and you mount it up on the tower. I got to warn you one thing, though. 
if you plug these two things together, the, the, the radio and its feed point and all the electronics, you plug it into the, the mount, you'll never get it back off again without doing some damage. So don't plug that together until you're done running the cable up through here, pulling it out, putting the RJ45 connector on, making sure it's good, plug it, test it first, and then, and only then, put this together. And you may wonder, how do, how do I know this? <laughs> yeah, you didn't order the special key that, that unlocks this pair. D did they have one? No, I don't know. I was making that up. <laughs> I, I, so what I did, I, I, usually, I went to YouTube. I said, how do you, get, <laughs> how do you take a part of ubiquity, uh, whatever this is, radio, and somebody showed, well, you put a screwdriver right here and you turn real hard and you pull it out. All right, Kirk, I'll go you one better on the show and tell. I just Woo, bought this. This is a uh, cross-polarized 950 Yagi. Okay. It's long and ten. Holy cow. Oh. You How put somebody's eye out that with thing? that thing. <laughs> you could eat very easily. It's got two uh, SMA connectors. This comes right out of the business end. And then you attach this ubiquity radio. This is a, a rocket. Okay. Uh, ubiquity rocket. And uh, see, you got your two connections on the top. They plug into there. This thing snaps onto here. whole thing sits outdoors. And I, I'm interested in trying this out because you're supposed to get a, a pretty good throughput because it uses a technology they call uh, MIMO. Is that MIMO? I don't know what, yeah. how, if you pronounce that or not. Multiple yeah. in, multiple out. Yeah, multiple in, multiple out. It uses both V and H. It's still a simplex radio. Only one end is going to talk at a time, but it's going to be able to talk a lot faster. So you, uh, it's supposed to go farther. But I, I've got a, uh, I've got a, an application in mind for that. Between uh, one of our FMs, we have a charter uh, cable out there, and it's costing us about 130 a month. For, it's a backup. So I'm going to try to link that uh, uh resource to our AM transmitter plant, which doesn't have a, a backup right now of audio. And, and be a, well, we, we have a land link out there, but this is going to be a second backup to give us a internet service out at our AM plant. And here again, we'll hang another codec on there for you know, a, it, a third backup. Joe, let me get your thoughts on this. But my, my thought on some of this technology is this. We're getting some tech here that is really inexpensive. I like a sub hundred dollar parts. Exactly. Uh, you know the, the the meat and the potatoes, the radio that does the work, pretty cheap. But we still have to do the engineering right. We we can't just toss this up and expect it to work. There's rain. There's ice. There's lightning. There's all the dangers of putting something outdoors. And it's got to be aimed right. It's got to be above the trees because this stuff is mostly line of sight. Um, it still requires knowledgeable, even though the stuff is cheap. It doesn't mean that installing it and planning it is going to be cheap and easy. Right. Nothing is going to free you of that responsibility. Um, so you, you gotta got to know your stuff, and you got to take the time and do it right. I'm excited about trying some of the stuff out. Hey, uh, uh, if you're watching the show and <laughs> or listening, obviously you are. This is uh, episode number 218 of This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack along with Joe Talbot and our guest Bob Newberry. Uh, Bob's the Market Director of Engineering for Clear Channel in uh, northern uh, Alabama, uh, Birmingham, and and Gadsden, and also uh, Tuscaloosa. We're uh, we're getting around to our main subject here shortly. I, 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 uh, I'm sorry if we put it off too, too long, and that is uh, Bob's adventure in finding out about SIP telephony, and that's pretty cool. So hang on. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Right now, I want to tell you about one of our sponsors, and that is Lavo, console company out of Germany, and they make this incredibly cool console called the Crystal Clear. It's a virtual radio mixing console. Hey, meet Crystal Clear. It's a console for radio that has this great multi-touch touchscreen interface with your faders on it. Uh, and you can touch buttons to bring up more processing uh, uh, functionalities, mic processing, uh, uh, headphone uh, uh, functions, and mix minus functions. Um, it, it does use this multi-touch enabled mixing control. That's this big touchscreen, which, by the way, is a PC running an app. And it's tied by, uh, by network 
to the DSP mixing uh, engine uh, that also has the audio inputs and outputs. So it's this one RU box that fits in a rack, and that's where your audio inputs, including your mics, your analog and uh, IE, uh, AES inputs and outputs go to. And then with just standard computer networking, you hook it up to a computer, and mm -hmm. they suggest uh, using this uh, beautiful HP multi-touch touchscreen PC running, uh, I believe, Windows 8. And it just makes a beautiful, gorgeous-looking uh, uh, way to mix mix audio. Um, there are three stereo mixing groups, Program 1, Program 2, and Record. Uh, there's Integrated Q, or pre-fader level, uh, with metering. There's Programmable Scene Presets that recall every detail of how you have it already set up so that your, uh, your announcers can quickly change from one setup to another. Uh, precision stereo PPM meters, Euro and U.S. operating modes. So the way that they like to do things in Europe sometimes is different than how uh, we do things here in the U.S. Uh, time of day clock, easily synchronized to an NTP server. Um, this, there's uh, support for guests with talkback, so you can talk back privately to, uh, to a, 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 a guest who's on headphones, for example. Um, and uh, 24 sources available. Eight can be active at the same time. Uh, on the console with that uh, gorgeous multi-touch interface. Uh, the DSP core, um, well, all the audio stays in the engine. None of it goes to the attached PC. That's, that's just for control only. It has low noise, mic preamps, um, two separate amplified headphone outputs, and, of course, you could add more after that, uh, balanced analog inputs and outputs, plus AES, uh, EBU inputs and outputs. And uh, it does have optional Ravenna, audio over IP. Now, that's AES67 compliant, and that means it'll talk to a whole world of other uh, devices that are now becoming available, that are now becoming either Ravenna or AES67 compliant. Uh, some of the gear from Axia, some of the gear from other console manufacturers, and some of the gear mm -hmm. from Telos, for example, will connect up and, and talk to uh, the AES67 uh, standard. Uh, there's power supply redundancy, and there's GPIO for on-air lamps. So if you want to check this out, and I encourage you to, if this kind of console uh, seems like the cat's meow for you, um, go to lavo.com. That's L-A-W-O. L-A-W-O dot com. And go, look under the radio products and look for the crystal clear, one word, crystal clear, audio console. On the Lavo site, you'll also find other radio consoles, the Sapphire and the Crystal. These may be of interest to you, too, as well as some routing systems and some uh, big consoles for uh, television and other live, uh, live productions. We thank Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Again, the website is Lavo, L-A-W-O, Lavo dot com. All right, we're moving on with episode 218 of This Week in Radio Tech. Bob Newberry is our guest, and let's jump into what maybe I should have earlier in the show. <laughs> that is uh, SIP telephony. You know, Joe Talbot, Joe, you've been a guest on the show before talking about this thing called SIP telephony. And so I'm going to back out a little bit here. Uh, uh, Bob, you told me before the show that you got interested in SIP telephony a couple of years ago as an experiment for providing cheaper and quality telephone service for your offices and then maybe eventually for your studios uh, in your smaller markets. So tell us how you got started, and then uh, you and Joe just carry on with this uh, interesting topic. Well, we just kind of jumped right in about six years ago. Uh, Birmingham has uh, had a VIA then. We were paying really a, a huge uh, exorbitant amount for maintenance, uh, 850 a month just on the maintenance contract for the Avaya gear. And it's good gear, uh, no doubt. But I started looking on the Internet uh, at this asterisk, and I wasn't real sure what it was, so I read up on it and went to these uh, voip.org and the asterisk website and a few other websites and I found a, a website called uh, Elastix. It's E L A S T I X. Uh, I think it's .org, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, mm -hmm, it is. But they make a uh, they make a distribution disk that takes uh, the Asterisk uh, open source software, and they uh, they add it with free PBX, and they package it up with with their front end on it too. It's a GUI front end because. If you, if a lot of people that started out asterisk the old way was you have to do it through Linux, and uh, I, I'm just not that good at it. So uh, I don't know a lot about it. So I just took this distribution disk, disk we downloaded, 
plugged it into a PC I had, and lo and behold, 15 minutes later, I had a, uh, a functioning telephone system. But I didn't have any telephones. So the next thing I did <laughs> is order a couple of uh, cheap SIP telephones to try it out. And I just sat in, the t in our technical center and made a call from one ear to the other and said, hey, that works pretty well. Uh, so th the more confidence I gained in it, uh, we decided in, in Tuscaloosa, we had some uh, uh, little basic phone system mounted on the wall with uh, uh, about 15 telephone sets, and it was at the end of its life. So I decided to, to go ahead and try it over there, and we ordered a, a, a PRI circuit, and uh, a Digium, the company that makes Asterix, also makes these uh, PCI cards that plug into the computer. And they make uh, T1 cards. They make uh, cards that deliver POTS lines, telephone sets. That would be called an FXS card for foreign, uh, uh, what's that, Joe? Foreign Exchange Station, Station. I think. Yes, Foreign uh, Exchange Office, FXO, and Foreign Exchange Station. Yeah. Those, those cards really aren't that cheap. I, I can't remember exactly what we paid for them, but they're in the $1,000 range. Uh, for like eight ports. Like, so we got two of those cards given us 16 POTS lines, basically, and a card that gave us a, a T1 input that we plugged the PRI into. And that, that and 15 uh, telephone sets, 15 to 20 telephone sets, I can't remember exactly, over in Tuscaloosa, and that gave them a functioning uh, phone system that worked in the offices as well as the studios. Uh, I didn't know any better. I just jumped right in and did the studios, too, you know, with the asterisk system. It's not a separate uh, line driving the studios over there or here or anywhere in our, in our little fiefdom. But one of the other things, once we gained experience on, in that Tuscaloosa market for a couple of years, uh, we'd, I felt confident enough that I could do it here in Birmingham. So we, we did the same thing using about 35 telephones and, uh, and four of these uh, Digium cards in a computer to give us 32 POTS lines that we fed to all the control rooms. Uh, we have Telos 2x12s in each control room. And, uh, and that gave us a fully functioning uh, set, uh, telephone system for about... I want to say about fifteen thousand dollars. Very inexpensive. Uh, we've never really had any trouble out of it. Yeah, the the audio quality is real good, excellent. And another thing we found out we could do is uh, you can talk from asterisk to asterisk. And so we put in these circuits between uh, Birmingham and uh, Tuscaloosa, and then Birmingham over to Gadsden. And, and recently down to Montgomery, our Montgomery station, uh, Josh Harton's the engineer down there. And we, uh, I talked him into doing this, <laughs> but we set up Asterix down there. So now all four of these uh, Asterix systems are tied together with an Asterix uh, protocol called uh, IAX. I think, is that right, Joe? Yeah, it is. That's um, the, the trunk protocol. It works really well. Um, yeah, inter Telos, exchange. And uh, I've got about a dozen stations all tied together with it also. Okay. You know, yeah, I, I, was, I got real interested in, in, the, uh, in, in setting up the dial plan uh, or the routing of these calls. So if, I'm, uh, if I pick up my phone and I dial an extension in Tuscaloosa, it goes over the, our point-to-point -point circuit and not, not out the t to the uh, provider and back in their provider, which is uh, it's all windstream down here. But, but that way, uh, or, or if I want to call... Uh, uh, a business in Tuscaloosa, just any other business not even associated with us, when I dial the, the number, the, uh, the, the dial plan sees that it's a Tuscaloosa number and puts it on the point to point and goes out their PRI out there. And so it He's makes it a rooting. local call. And kind of you avoid toll charges that way, but not that that really adds up to much in this day and age. But it was more of the interest it's, it's in being though. able to do that. I'm sorry. Oh, I said the the uh, far end hop off like that in least cost routing is really elegant. It's an it's, yeah. It just seems like you should do it. I mean, realistically, long distance doesn't really cost us anything in these days it for the most part. But uh, it's nice to be able to keep calls on your network and have them never touch the public network at all. 
You know, and when there are problems with the with the public network, it's a way of getting around. And, and uh, I was talking with Jeff Peacock uh, in Mobile at a Clear Channel Mobile uh, facility about uh, being able to do. See, he he's a he's got asterisk from about probably 10, 12 years ago. Uh, he he's a, an early adopter. But he doesn't. Ha he's not providing. He, he's not providing it with SIP service yet. I think he's still using a PRI uh, or individual lines. But once you go SIP, that opens up a whole other world of being able to do a lot of things uh, from the provider level. Uh, and we were talking about if he had a hurricane down there and had to abandon his studios for whatever reason, we could instantly channel his. Uh, his phone line, studio phone lines, up to our studio and go on the air up here and feed his transmitters uh, through how, the How do you do channels. that? Do you have to contact uh, Windstream or a provider? How do you get well, something? Well, Windstream, uh, that you, you do it online. You log in, uh -huh. and you can, you can do it instantly as long okay. as everybody's on SIP. And, 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 and I guess I got ahead of myself when I was talking about Asterix. We started out using PRI into the Asterix because I just didn't know anything about SIP. I knew it, it worked SIP on the set side, but I didn't know how to apply it on the uh, provider side until I learned a little more. So it, it, it was a little learning experience over a couple of years before I took the plunge. And we did that first uh, over in Gadsden, uh, a, a very small clear channel market. We were able to uh, get Windstream to give us SIP service. And that eliminated the need for the PRI. And, and the, the good thing about uh, Windstream doing that is they, they also provide the QoS because they, they put the router uh, out at your location. And mm -hmm. so the QoS is, is put on uh, the SIP traffic, so it's number one priority. And then all your Internet services and, every, and, and uh, uh, point to point data is a lower priority. So the call quality is always real good. We very rarely have any kind of stutter in it. And it's good enough to put on the air. So we did that in all three markets. And now tomorrow, actually, in Tuscaloosa, we're, we're finally going to drop that PRI and go to uh, SIP service with Windstream over there. Wow. Wow. And that'll tie. Uh, that, that'll give us uh, all uh, four markets uh, with asterisk. Uh, via Windstream uh, with SIP audio. Bob, what would you say to somebody like me? I, I'm getting ready to move my own little radio stations in Mississippi, and we're, we're thinking of going to SIP for our on-air lines. We already do uh, a hosted PBX solution for our business circuits. Uh, what, what do I need to go be looking into? And we're not as big as Clear Channel, of course, so uh, I'm not sure. I guess we're going to go with the cloud provider and our Internet connection. Do you have some suggestions about what I need to look for? I wish I did, but the the question I still have is is, is QoS and how do you how do you maintain your quality of service uh, on your SIP packets and make them the most important thing uh, to that provider? If you're if you're dealing with a, a, a cable company maybe that has their own uh, SIP service or or Vonage, from what I understand, with limited knowledge of Vonage, I think they provide a router to your it's, house well, or your it's, business. It's, it's, it's a little, uh, yeah, but, okay. They, but they, you they, can't really do QoS over the public internet. I mean, once correct. it gets in, once it gets onto the internet, isn't it every man for himself, every packet's for himself? <laughs> yeah, basically? exactly. Okay, pretty much. Yeah, unless you're Netflix or you're paying extras. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why that's why I felt confident going, you know, being with Windstream or AT and T or any large provider that they're going to be able to handle that aspect of it, at least to their switch. the 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 other benefit of uh, of our situation here in Alabama is that Windstream's switch is in Birmingham, even if you're in Tuscaloosa or Gadsden or Montgomery. Their, their only switch in the area is in Birmingham. So it all flows real well, and it all gets the top priority uh, as far as getting those packets through. So, so that, Joe, that was like, my big worry. You know, you can yeah, take a little, yeah. a little uh, hesitation on a phone call in your office, but you don't want that on the air. It's got right. to sound good on the air 100% of the time, and it does. It does work real well. Joe, it sounds to me like um, 
these providers like Windstream or others that that bring fiber or bring copper to your building. Usually copper, yeah. Yeah, are, are, are they promising uh, service quality right right up to that point? Typically, yes, because um, most of these situations, it's going to be a T1 to the premises, and they're going to put a device on the wall, a router, basically, with the device called an IAD, uh, which is, let's see, integrated access device. It's, okay. it's a router. It's generally got a PRI port or two. It might even have some POTS ports on it. Um, they'll do that, and they'll – so what, what they typically do is they run a package, a software package, and – They'll provide a little bit of the internet and some voice, and the voice is set up uh, with priority. And they're actually on separate networks. It isn't like they hand you the internet and then you hook up your stuff to the internet. There's a, sp a, a special uh, IP address, you know, a se special network block they stick you on, and it's pretty much a point to point circuit or at least controlled. Gotcha. Yeah, and and with that kind of service, you're you're not competing with other packets that that's 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 almost like bringing in PRI or, or T1 in, in terms of the quality of the connection between you and that provider right right I mean you're literally talking directly to them okay. in, in those situations where you have to do uh, use the internet um, like maybe your little stations um, I'll put in a DSL because typically a, a DSL has less jitter you know the 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 speeds don't vary as much uh, on a DSL as they do on on cable company stuff. Um, I mean, even when I'm talking to you sometimes on some of our you know our company meetings, uh, I'll have issues on my end and, and you have issues on your end. And uh, I've got all my voice traffic here is DSL. All my uh, regular data traffic is either through the cable company, which is miserable, or more more often it's over the wireless. I have a a carrier here in town that gives me a, a five five gigahertz connection. And I get about seven megs down from them at about two up, and the jitter is acceptable. But the the, the jitter on the on the um, DSL is actually the best, and the DSLs are really slow. There, one's a one point five, and the other one is a uh, is a three, and seven hundred sixty eight k up. So yeah. they're just really tiny little circuits, but there's very low jitter on them, and, and they're cheap too. So that's what I use. Gotcha. Well, Bob, uh, if you had the to do again, you, you kind of took us through your learning process. You started with a station where you, you couldn't make a mis you could make a mistake if you had to and, and gas them. <laughs> uh, what, if you're doing it over again, what would you, uh, wh where would you go to learn about this? How would you get yourself up to speed on, on SIP? I, I don't think I'd be, do it any different than what I did. Uh, it, it, it's great to get that, uh, that, the distribution disk from them, put it in a PC that you are not using, and uh, it'll it'll rewrite the whole hard drive with with uh, Linux and uh, and the all the applications, and uh, and that other other than that, going reading a lot online. You know, if you type an asterisk, do a Google search, or or say a particular problem you're having. You start typing the problem in the Google box, it finishes the sentence for you because <laughs> yes, it, does. Yeah. it knows. And, <laughs> well, and there's thousands of people that had that same problem, and the answer will be out there. Yes. And, yeah, I, sh I sure have no. In fact, I, hey, Joe, I, I told you uh, earlier today when you, were, when you and I were talking, last night I kind of took the plunge and said, I'm going to order a, by golly, uh, uh, cloud SIP provider phone line. So I went on to vitality.com. Uh, com or net or whatever it is and i Great. signed up i gave my credit card I, I i got a phone line a sip line i didn't realize till later that i needed to associate it with a with a, a number so i did that and then uh, i thought it was all working okay but then so i was using uh in, I, I got some some uh, hard phones that i could use but i have an app uh, that joe that you introduced me to it's an app called bria and yeah. it's a paid oh, paid yeah. for app yeah and and so um, I couldn't, I, I could get it to register, but I couldn't make a call. And even on the Vitality's online status page, I could see that I, this phone was registered with their SIP server, but it wouldn't make it, it would drop the call immediately. And so I, Google's your friend, right? So I, I, I Googled as much as I could, you know, figure out how to describe it, this problem. Well, the problem was that I didn't have the codec selection in the right order. And Joe, you may remember some months ago, I was at your office and we were playing with AMR wideband. And so I still had AMR wideband selected and G711 wasn't selected. 
And so Cut. I fixed that, put because I'd had the app for months. And so I fixed that, put it in the right order, bam, made a phone call, and it worked. And Google's your friend. <laughs> And, One thing about a, Fidelity, too, and I, yeah. I, I dread calling tech support for companies because everybody's overtaxed and it's usually, you know, it's usually kind of a drag. But the guys at Fidelity are amazing. Um, I, I have friends there and they will call me with a, wanting me to test things for them sometimes. Or they'll call me and they'll say, have you experienced this? And I've had some really off the wall problems uh, with other providers and, and I've been able to explain it to them and they've been able to get to the bottom of it and, and get it fixed. I mean, they take it as a personal challenge. So it's not your usual, uh, I mean, you don't get some call center in India who's reading you cards. It's, it's totally different. So um, they're pretty good that way. Another company that's good is one called Voice Pulse. Those are my two favorites right now. I also use the one called Flow Route out of Vegas and they, they've been very good, but uh, it's, it's sometimes getting uh, um, examples of uh, how to set things up can be difficult, although Vitality has um, on their support page actually has stuff you can cut and paste right into uh, into asterisk or whatever to, to get set up, and th yeah, that helps me out them. a lot. Yeah. Just, I mean, I can I can do it manually, but it's so much better just to to cut and paste and not have to worry about I, taking I, the yeah, time gotta, to you know. I, I got to point out this is a skill set. This is a knowledge set that most of us broadcast engineers don't have. Uh, and so it's, it's all new. And now last night I was playing with the Vitality website and, and they were using some terminology that I did. I couldn't guess. I didn't understand. I ended up taking a couple stabs at it and eventually got it right. Bob, did, did you notice this, that, that the, what you, you got to fill out a field and you don't quite know what goes in there. Oh yeah. I've ran into that, like the SIP registration string that you yeah. have to put in and that, that, I was sweating bullets, I think, in Gadsden's, the, our first experience with a SIP provider and, and trying to get the registration string, which is the long string of numbers, basically, and passcodes and everything else to get registered so your SIP server talks to the provider's SIP server. Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, a, a hard experience, hard learning experience. But, but it, once, it's, once it connects, it, it's really great because it just... Uh, there, there's asterisk gives you a lot of logging information, so you can really spot a problem uh, pretty quickly and find out whether it's a problem on Windstream's end or on your end, and, uh, and that works pretty well. You were talking about Bria earlier. Uh, I've got Bria on my laptop and on my tablet, and uh, about five years ago when we were, uh, when I was still learning this, uh, we had it only running in Tuscaloosa. Our program director uh, took a missionary trip to uh, China. I'm not sure exactly where he was in China, but he had Wi-Fi in the, in the place he was at. So he took his laptop and I put Bria on it and he went over there. Uh, and, and of course our asterisk system is behind the clear channel firewall, but, but he, he activated his VPN and brought up Bria and started making phone calls. And he said it, it, it worked so well. He had the other missionaries uh, uh, the people over there on this missionary trip in line, wanting, uh, waiting to call home from his laptop because it, it, nice? uh, it was better and oh, cheaper than it, they could from the hotel room. Absolutely. Are you guys using um, the uh, wideband G722 codec? Um, uh, pardon me, HD audio. Are you using that on your systems out there? Uh, no, I haven't tried that yet. A and I've been talking to Ed, my IT guru, about that. And, and uh, we, we want to do an experiment. You know, actually, even with, G uh, with 711, with a good microphone on your tablet or your phone, uh, it actually sounds pretty good. But, but, w but I do want to try that. Better. Yeah, give it a shot. It'll it'll blow your mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I mean, we have stations that are using it for their news departments are using it, or they're using it to go out to uh, do remotes and and so forth. And uh, they just come in on the public internet with the G seven twenty two call, and it rings into their VX, and the VX supports it that's, natively. That's so key, it sounds. Though. I've got to have that VX right now. I've got to I've got to go down to uh, POTS lines and go into a standard uh, into our two by twelve. Uh, although it, it's only, uh, uh, you know, you're talking about 100 feet from the, the asterisk to the, the, the telos in the other room. But it, uh, I don't know if there's a roll off uh, on that or not. Uh, there is. What the, the bandwidth would be uh, on, on or the available va bandwidth on a POTS line given 722 into the front end of it. Do you know? 
I mean, what um, it, it's not going to help it, you a lot. I mean, the first thing in a in an analog telephone interface, the first thing that it hits is a, either if it's a digital one, one of ours, for example, like a two by twelve. It hits a codec, and the codec has a 300 to 3,000 3, hertz filter. 300 3, so it's got right. roll off on the low end, which makes actually the biggest difference in terms of warmth yeah. and naturalness. And it has, of course, a brick wall filter on the high end. So that uh, that's gives you that classic telephone sound. But when you know, if you get a chance to play with a, a VX or one of our other codecs, uh, it, it'll blow you away. We, sh- we showed Mark. it at, the, at NAB, and people were having a really hard time believing that's what it was. I imagine. I imagine. Our original installation of our 2x12s, we had ISDN interfaces because our Avaya, uh, we had ISDN ports on it. And and that was really the classy way to go. I mean, oh, yeah. call setup was almost instantaneous over the PRI circuit. But but when we when we went to Asterix, I, I researched and researched uh, ISDN on the station set side and could find no information. Uh, evidently, they use it in Europe a little bit, but there's very, very few uh, places in America that use ISDN on the telephone set side. You yeah, know. Um, the system that I've got here at home, and actually the one we have at Telos, uh, the, the Millennium, Core Telco Millennium, oh, okay. this actually is an ISDN telephone. And uh, it's an ST interface, you know, European type interface. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, um, there are cards for Astros you can buy that will do the ST interface. And we played around with that a little bit. And you can do it. You just can't do circuit switch data through trunks. There's no support for any of that. But uh, okay, you you go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I, we, we I went with a company uh, called Zorcom. They made these uh, Astro banks. They're they're one yes. rack. Unit, uh, then they they're USB connected to your Asterix computer, but they said I I bought these on the, on the premise that they would do that, and then after going back and forth with the factory for for like months, they uh, they said well it's not going to work, and so that was the end of that. We just had to pull them out. But yeah, the you, magic, you're saying magic that somebody can do that now. Data. And uh, like if you've got to tell us uh, extreme or something like that and you want to run it through asterisk, it's not going to be a, a good experience. Yeah. If you do run it through one of these Millennium switches, it will work just fine because it was a, it's an ISDN kind of a reference switch. I mean, it, it fully implements everything. Okay. But that, that's, that's the time long ago now, ISDN. Right. I think it's becoming harder and harder to find anyway other than with it the PRI. Is. And that's going away. Channelized you, uh, data. Were you using um, um, the the, U, the a USA type U interface or the ST interface on your Avaya when you were using that? Uh, the, it was like the USA interface. Okay, the two wire interface. Got it. Yeah, the two wire interface. Okay. Yeah, the each Avaya, I think it had eight ports, uh, so we had several of those circuit cards in there, uh, and and each. Uh, uh, each phone, the two by twelve, is a has two ports for a total of four B channels. Is that I think that's mm-hmm. the way it was. Right. So we had to pull those cards out and plug in the POTS cards to when we went to the asterisk. But we have a lot of customers that are using either PBXs or like uh, Atlas or AdTran devices uh, to take a PRI and break it up into individual BRIs. But you can oh, get yeah. PRIs easily enough, but BRIs are about to become impossible to get and very expensive to get. But yeah. a lot of uh, well, most of the Telos gear, just about all of it, in fact, has uh, the ST interface available, the four wire interface. If you've got an extreme, just move the plug over to the four wire interface. Uh, at my last radio station, all of our codecs were behind the PBX and were fed with PRIs, and it was dirt cheap, and it sounded great and very reliable. Yeah, we have an AdTran Atlas uh, 800 here in Birmingham that we use uh, feed. Uh, well, we're down to one. We had, when we were running the Avaya system, we had three PRIs, but when we went to SIP, I, I kept one PRI just for all our uh, our Zephyrs and uh, uh, other codecs. Um, to use and, and so it's not being used as much as it as it was uh, originally, but that's a good system. Yeah, we we'll use have. it for codex and fax machines, stuff like that. Well, th- I was going to bring that up. Uh, a fax machine. That's one thing. Windstream, uh, they wouldn't guarantee fax machines on their uh, SIP service. They said it works, but if you're a high volume fax user, they wouldn't recommend it. But but we get away with it. We've had no problems uh, with it. 
Um, all our faxes seem to come through, and that's it's G711, I think, same codec they use. It, it's it is, probably not supposed to work, but it does work. And I'm, I'm yeah, waiting there may for be the fax machine to go away once in a while, and uh, the speed, I mean, it is a modem after all, and modems don't work well through VO, but pardon me, modems pretty much don't work at all through VOIP. Um, if you ran like a right. 103, nobody runs those anymore, or 202, uh, you might be able to get away with it. system might, but, yeah. Um, yeah. A basic, uh, 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 like uh, ADT uh, alarm systems, like 300 baud. I think they'll. I think they'll work. Yeah, a lot of that stuff um, is. Some of the stuff's DTMF. I won't say a lot of it. Some of it actually sends a bunch of touch tones, and there are some issues sometimes depending on your provider and the way you have things set up with DTMF. I mean, you've probably seen the RFC 2833 option for DTMF. Um, that's the most common, best way to do it. There's also in-band, and, uh, and there's a couple other different options, but pretty much everybody standardized on RFC 2833. And, and once in a while, you'll get a provider that has it set wrong, and you'll send a touch tone, and it just won't make it through. You won't hear anything. Or I've actually had circuits where you heard the touch tone twice because mm -hmm. something's set up wrong. So. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's the kiss of death with an engineer that uses touchstones all the time to talk to the transmitter sites. I mean, that exactly. that has to work. Yeah, and but that might go away someday if we can get just real easy IP connectivity. Yeah, because the the touchstone, I mean, or the the dial tone DTMF is 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 in fact. I, I think that's generated locally in the phone just for your confidence. When you push the buttons, you're not sending that DTMF from the phone to your PBX, you're just sending the digit. And the, 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 it's just, uh, if, you're, if you're going out of POTS line, it has to generate that DTMF tone locally. And, and, I was and dealing... what you hear in your ear is just locally generated for your confidence that you actually push the button and it worked. Exactly right. When we were doing the early VX development, I was working with the provider, the, I mean the developers over in Europe, and the system at that time didn't make any of the tones. And I said, well, it's got to do that or people aren't going to think it's working. And also, people here in the U.S., have companies have automated attendance that you have to be able to blast through. If you call a company, you never get a person anymore. And they thought that was just bizarre, but they, <laughs> they put it in. And so the, the VX does some kind of amusing things with the tones. It, it plays tones in your ear when you're on the handset for your you know confidence. And if you're actually on a con uh, dialing on the air, it substitutes the tones that are being played over the air with different tones so that uh, the phone number you're dialing is not given out over the air effectively. So it kind of scrambles oh, like them that. and plays some tones yeah. that sound yeah. like touch yeah. tones but aren't and also lets you do things like upload your own funny noises to take the place <laughs> of touch tones if, if you wanted to do that. So we, when we started fixing it, we, we went a little overboard and added some, some fun stuff too. Hey, guys, uh, we're going to take a quick pause here. Uh, think of uh, how we're going to wrap the show up uh, after we hear from our sponsor, uh, Telos, and the Telos Zip 1. Uh, you know, I've talked about the Telos Zip 1 quite a bit because I just love this product. It, it does great. We use it at our, our radio stations. I've got one right here uh, behind me. You can just about see it on, on the video. Um, this was just connected. It's connected to the same Internet service that my Skype is going out on right now. And I'm going to hit a button here, auto. I'm going to dial uh, another Zip1 that's actually, I believe, in Austria. How about that? It connected that fast. I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. I'll show you again here. Watch this. Auto and auto again. That is, uh, let's see, let's turn that down a little bit. Let's see if I can tell you what the codec is that's going on right here. Ah. Uh, I'm receiving from them HEAAC at 96 kilobits per second, and I'm sending AAC at 128 kilobits per second, and that's going. That's connecting to Austria, Austria, and I'm in Nashville, <laughs> Tennessee. So, hey, uh, we've I've been connected for weeks at a time to other other Zip ones, and you know one of our uh, 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 guests here on the show, uh, Dave Anderson. Dave uses uh, Zip ones. He's got almost 40 of them now. He uses them as STLs to transmitter sites that otherwise they just couldn't afford to feed all these transmitters and translators uh, with uh, traditional 
expensive STL system. So they use uh, high bit rate uh, codecs. They use medium bit rates in a couple places where they have to. So the Zip1, it, what is it? What's well, an IP audio codec? A very professional one. It's got different algorithms in it, like um, MPEG Layer 2 and AAC and HEAAC. Uh, an, one called uh, AAC ELD, that's Enhanced Low Delay, um, and just regular low delay as well. Plus, optionally, you can get APTX, Aptex, if that's your standard. Um, you hook it up to an internet connection or to a dedicated WAN or to an IP radio. Uh, it'll also, by the way, do linear. And uh, that was an experiment that uh, Brian Jones and I did. Linear audio, uh, 2.4 megabits per second from Washington State to Tennessee for five weeks. Now, it may have hiccuped when I wasn't in the room, but it never hiccuped when I was sitting here in my office listening to the great Christmas music that Brian Jones was providing uh, during the last holiday season. Point is, the Zip1 is this ultra cool box. It lets you go out, hook up to other people's internet, hook up to uh, wireless services like Clearwire or Verizon 4G LTE, go do a remote broadcast. Hey, we just heard from a station in Cleveland, Ohio, a public radio station, WCPN, and they went out and did a live remote broadcast from uh, one of these all-natural, locally uh, locally produced milk uh, dairies where they were – it's an ice cream shop. And they, they have fabulous ice cream made with uh, local, locally uh, harvested, locally milked cows and uh, <laughs> uh, locally sourced ingredients from the farmer's market. Anyway, they did a, a broadcast uh, interviewing the, uh, the owners and some, uh, some other guests. You can find that interview. It's on the WCPN website. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Point is, people are using these for live remotes, uh, for a, a, a talent, a disc jockeys, announcers who maybe have to work from home for uh, voiceover work and for studio transmitter links to get audio from the studio to the transmitter and bring it back. Or maybe you've got a satellite dish at the transmitter site. You need to bring that audio back reliably. Uh, it handles contact closures that remain in sync with the audio. Handles RS-232 data as well. So that's enough about the Zip1. You ought to check it out for yourself. Uh, go to the uh, Telos website at telos-systems.com and click on the Zip1. You'll find all kinds of uses for it. Once you understand how to get it hooked up to IP, it is really great. You're going to enjoy it. And, uh, hey, I use it at my stations. We do a couple of cool things with Zip1s ourselves. And there are literally thousands of them now all around the world. Thanks, Telos, and thanks to the Zip1 for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Well, guys, we're almost out of time. Uh, Bob, I wonder what kind of closing thoughts you might have uh, for us and uh, about SIP telephony. Well, I'll let you know tomorrow when we finally <laughs> do our final conversion from uh, our last uh, Asterisk in install that has a, a, a PRI that we're going to convert to SIP. That's tomorrow. And uh, okay. I don't anticipate any troubles. I think it'll work just fine. And then I'll let you know after that. But SIP's, SIP's the way of the future. Uh, so you got to put that telephone hat on if you want to be an engineer, I think, these days. You can't just call the, the phone company. Uh, it's, it's really it's a computer, and it's an IP audio uh, device. So uh, it's really kind of getting more into our, into our expertise uh, all, more and more, like you said uh, earlier in the show. Mm -hmm. That uh, mm -hmm. you almost have to know telephone uh, these days uh, to work in radio. Joe, I, I like the fact that if you when you get into SIP telephony, you can end up saving money and or improving the quality. And if you do it right, your reliability can be as good and maybe even better than your than we've been accustomed to with uh, telco services like uh, POTS and, and PRI. Isn't that right, Joe? I, I think so. I've saved a ton of money using it, but I mean, nobody cares more about your stuff than you do. And mm -hmm. that's why I, I, rather than sit on the phone and talk to some help desk where they're writing things down and completely screwing up your trouble ticket, I'd rather just do it myself. I'd rather own the problem. I'm okay with that. Not everybody is. I mean, we're all wearing a bunch of hats these days, but yeah. it's not so bad to be the phone man. You're way smarter than they are. So you might as well take <laughs> advantage of that fact. And how, how did you keep Bob away from me? We he sounds like me. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We I do. Have, 
Yeah. I, I want to try out this, uh, some of this, you know, we're big fans of free PBX building our own and, and, and I've got free PBX running on this raspberry Pi, right. Uh, here in the office to, to provide dial tone to a few phones and actually connect me to Google talk. But, uh, I want to try out uh, some other distros too. There's, there's elastics that, uh, that Bob happened to, uh, across and he's liking that very much. These are based uh, typically on, on Linux. And so you, you get a distro CD and you put it in, you, you wipe a whole computer out and now you've got a computer running Linux that you may not know much about, but the good news is you get this GUI and you can immediately start uh, uh, building a phone system uh, and making it work. Uh, one of the things about SIP, though, is you don't have to do it all yourself. You can have this stuff hosted elsewhere if you want to pay for that and, and the support and convenience that may go along with that. That's how my stations do it for our business phones. We pay 8 by 8 to host it for us. And, uh, you know, that has certain advantages. It may, it may have certain disadvantages, too, but they've been very responsive, too. Point is, you got a lot of options. you got a lot of options when you go to SIP for delivery and for who's providing the service, how it gets in and out of your station, and how you're going to program it and what you're going to do with it. Wow, guys, thanks for being with us. Uh, Bob Newberry, uh, Market Director of Engineering for Birmingham, uh, for, for Clear Channel in Birmingham, Gadsden, and Tuscaloosa. Appreciate you being here, Bob. It's a trip. Glad to be here, Kirk. <laughs> Good to Hope meet you, Joe. Again some. Yeah, and Joe Talbot uh, from uh, Area 51. <laughs> thanks for being here as well. <laughs> Appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Kirk. Well, wow, thanks again. Thanks again. Hey, and if you want to know more about either of our sponsors, Lavo, uh, it's uh, lawo.com, and Telos Systems is telos-systems.com. Thanks a lot to Andrew Zarian, uh, at, back at headquarters with all the equipment there, switching the gear around, switching the cameras, and making us kind of look sort of good. Uh, Andrew, appreciate you being here and the entire GFQ network. We'll see you uh, next week on This Week in Radio Tech.